Um, I, we're really thrilled today to be joined by Tom Honig, who's the president and chief executive of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. Uh, and clearly, there's no question, I, I'm not sure that he's going to even discuss this, but there's no question that monetary policy and fiscal policy have been closely interlinked through the whole economic crisis. And what the Fed has been doing has been just a fascinating learning experience for all of us uh, to watch. So it must be even more fascinating to be living it. Um, Tom is also a member of the Federal Reserve System's Open Market Committee, and he's a trained economist. Uh, and he's able to join us today to share with us his remarks, knocking on the central bank's door. And so really, our deepest thanks for coming to join us, Tom. I can emphasize that uh, I think Maya did invite me here because I am uh, definitely outside the Beltway. Uh, Kansas City is uh, smack dab in the center of the United States, and in many ways it is uh, very central in its thinking. It has a broad base of uh, individuals, conservative, liberal, and you do get a nice mix, and it does give you, I think, a very important prism on the world. Uh, and prism on how people see Washington and what is going on there. So it is a real delight for me to be here. And also it brings, I think, a perspective uh, to the Open Market Committee meetings that I, I do participate in. I want to also just point out that uh, it's obvious by this panel, and I've, I've certainly enjoyed sitting through it, that we are moving into an era where the government finance is finally taking center stage, at least that's my observation. Fiscal measures um, taken to bring the economy out of the recession, uh, mounting longer term issues around Social Security and Medicare, and other growing demands actually put on the federal government have invited a massive buildup of debt, uh, both now and as far as the eye can see. The Congressional Budget Office projections have the federal debt reaching unsustainable levels, you've heard here today, somewhere between two and five times our national income within the next 50 years, which leads us to the inescapable conclusion that I've heard today, that U.S. fiscal policy must uh, focus on reducing the debt buildup and avoid the consequences of not doing so. So in managing our nation's debt, there's three, it uh, strikes me anyway, there's three options forward that I've heard defined here today to some extent. First, the worst choice of our long, uh, uh, in terms of our long-term stability, but perhaps the easiest in terms of short-term political options, uh, is that we can knock on the central bank's door and request it or demand that it print money to buy the swelling amounts of public debt. Or secondly, perhaps more tolerable politically, but still, uh, I think, all damaging to our economy, we can do nothing uh, so long as the domestic and foreign markets are willing to fund our borrowing needs at probably inevitably higher interest rates. Or third, the most difficult and probably the least palatable politically, we can act now to implement programs that reduce spending and increase revenues to more sustainable levels as far as our deficit and our debt look. Now, I recognize that this last option involves some pretty hard choices. Uh, however, in my view, it is, as others have said, the responsible path to sustainable growth. And the alternative options, I think, inevitably lead to financial crisis and greater long-run losses in our national income and wealth of this nation. The question of what combination of spending and revenue actions a country might choose is, of course, the purview of the Congress and the executive branch. As a central banker, I look at it as my responsibility to anticipate and to avoid the consequences that an unprecedented, unchecked uh, expansion of the debt 
may have on monetary policy itself. It is a fact that the current outlook for fiscal policy poses, I think, a real threat to the Federal Reserve's ability to achieve its dual mandates of price stability and maximum sustainable long-term growth, and therefore is a threat to its independence as well. The founders of the Federal Reserve, I think, understood this conflict. They understood that placing the printing press with the power to spend was a formula for financial disaster. Aware of this danger, they designed our central bank to be responsible for stable prices and long-term growth, emphasis on long-term, and they gave it a degree of independence so that it could carry out this mandate. The goal of policy cannot be just to get through the current challenge, but rather to rebuild the foundation of a stable and prosperous economy, looking at our long-run future. It's in this context that I appreciate and welcome from my, the opportunity to address and, uh, our, our fiscal challenges and the impact on policy. Some lessons from history. Well, throughout history, there are many examples of severe fiscal strains leading to major inflation. It seems inevitable that a government turns to its central bank to bridge budget shortfalls, with the result that being too rapid a money creation follows and eventually and not immediately, that's one of the elements of it, but eventually to higher inflation. Such outcomes require either a cooperative central bank or an infringement on its independence. While many, perhaps most nations, assert the importance and benefits of an independent central bank, the fact is when, the, when pressures mount, the immediate kind of overwhelms the long-term goals and the independence becomes an expedient to be foregone. Now, German hyperinflation is one classic, often cited example, and with good reason. When I was, first became a president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City in 1991, my 85-year-old neighbor gave me a 500,000 mark German note. He had been in Germany during the hyperinflation. And he told me that in 1921, that note he thought would buy a pretty good home. In 1923, it would buy a loaf, a loaf of bread. And he said to me, and I'll never forget it, I want you to have this note as a reminder. Your duty is to protect the value of the currency. And the note is framed and hangs in my office to this day. Now, someone recently said about my comments on hyperinflation that I evoked it for effect. Many say it can never happen here in the United States, far too sophisticated. And to them I ask, would anyone have believed three years ago that it was possible that the Federal Reserve Banks would have one and a quarter trillion dollars of mortgage-backed securities on their balance sheets today? I think not. So I ask your indulgence in reminding all that the unthinkable becomes possible when an economy is under severe stress. Now, if German hyperinflation seems an unrealistic example from the distant past, let's come forward a little bit. Many have noted that in the 1960s, as was noted here today, the Federal Reserve's willingness to accommodate fiscal demands and help finance the spending for the Great Society and the Vietnam War contributed to a period of accelerating price increases. Although the Federal Reserve was a reluctant participant, perhaps, it accepted the view that monetary policy should work in the same direction as the Congressional and Administration's goals and help finance at least part of the spending programs. Monetary policy accommodation during this period contributed to an increase in inflation from roughly 1.5% in 1965 to 6% in 1970. And it also helped, in my view, to stage ourselves for the great inflation of the 70s as inflation expectations eventually became unanchored. Last Friday, and it was mentioned again today, I read that an economist from the IMF raised the question of whether central banks should target a higher rate of inflation of around 6%, I think it was mentioned. While this may sound like a reasonable theory from a credible economist, my concern is that it is the process of rationalizing solutions to short-term problems that too long and too often have effects on our policy path going forward that can be and usually are harmful. 
Today, the United States is benefiting from the policies that were established in the 1980s to end the great inflation. Confidence in the long-run stability of the U.S. economy and the Federal Reserve's commitment to price stability have kept demands for treasuries relatively strong, allowing the government to borrow at low interest rates from citizens here and around the world. But I think it would be a mistake to take this current ability for granted and do nothing to address the mounting debt. While the last 30 years have been relatively stable, at least until recently, our long-term history with debt is less reassuring. From World War II to the present, nominal federal debt held by the public has increased over 30-fold. And supported by steady growth in the money supply, the price level has increased by a factor of 12. To me, that's a huge increase in the general price level, and it represents a significant reduction in purchasing power of the dollar over time. These are matters that demand our attention as we make choices involving the fiscal path forward and its impact and demands that will place on monetary policy. The immediate concerns, of course, is the size of the deficit. The CBO projects the deficit is almost 12% of GDP in fiscal 09, will be almost 8% this fiscal year. These are extraordinarily high levels by any standard. In the entire history of the United States, the government has run deficits over 10% of GDP in only a few instances, and usually only during the immediate period of the war or following it. As troubling as these deficits appear, even more disconcerting is the longer-term outlook for the federal debt caused by the accumulation of these deficits over time. The CBO's long-term projections clearly now show that the current fiscal policies are unsustainable. We've all heard that. In one scenario, the liftoff point for federal debt that is, the time when debt starts rising without a sign of stabilizing occurs shortly after 2020, and by 2035, federal debt held by the public reaches 80% of our gross domestic product, a level only exceeded during or just after World War II. In another more pessimistic scenario, the lift off in debt has only begun, or I should say has already begun with federal debt held by the public reaching 181% of GDP in 2035, easily exceeding the peak of that ratio of 113% at the end of World War II. So a key part of the problem stems from rapid growth in entitlement spending, we've heard that, including spending on Social Security and especially Medicare. Over the next 30 years, the Government Accounting Office has estimated that the present value of future expenditures on all social insurance programs exceeds future revenue by over $50 trillion. That is nearly four times the size of our GDP and is clearly unsustainable. Adding to my concerns, though, for the nation's economic prospects is the current level of private indebtedness. As with government debt in the United States, private non-financial debt has grown steadily over the post-World War period, from about 40% of GDP in 1945 to 175% in 2009. Every consumer and business that is a net borrower would benefit from lower interest rates. And just as noteworthy, it should, be, should not escape our notice that rising inflation would trim the real value of their indebtedness. Thus, high private indebtedness, I think, will contribute to the political pressure on the Federal Reserve to inflate. Now, the path forward. If I can return, in a sense, to my opening comments, I do see just three ways forward in dealing with this, cur with this current and prospective fiscal imbalance. While each involves pain, only the third, in my opinion, will resolve the imbalances without eventually also causing inflation to accelerate and precipitating a financial and economic crisis. The first option for dealing with this imbalance is for the central bank to succumb to the political pressure and monetize the debt. As deficits and debt levels within the country rise relative to national income, interest rates will tend to rise as well. 
In this instance, the central bank is often pressured to keep rates low and encouraged or required to assist the markets in facilitating the, get debt, the government's funding needs. If the central bank succumbs, its balance sheet will expand, bank reserves will grow, and inevitably the money supply will increase. This process often appears benign at first. It's welcome. But if it goes on unchecked, the outcome is almost always higher levels of inflation and immediately, ultimately, a loss of confidence in the value of the currency and the economy. Walter Baggett's famous dictum about banks holds equally true to governments. Once their soundness is questioned, it is too late. At that moment, governments and their citizens are forced to make sizable, painful fiscal adjustments. An example of both the political pressure that can be exerted on the central bank, as well as the inflationary consequences of debt monetization, I think is currently being played out, not just in Greece, but in Argentina. The president of Argentina uh, Central Bank was recently forced to resign because he would not transfer reserves held by the central bank to repay certain government debt. Inflation in Argentina is currently running near 8%, and I'm willing to bet it's going to go higher. Now, the second path is what I call stalemate between the fiscal and monetary authorities. In such a stalemate, the fiscal imbalance grows while an independent central bank maintains its focus on long-run price stability. Although the U.S. government is currently privileged to borrow at favorable rates, the fiscal outlook would inevitably, I think, undermine this privilege, adding risk premium and the price of its debt in terms of interest rates would increase. Also, as a government competes with the private borrowers for funds as the economy improves, the potential exists for the fiscal imbalance to drive up real cost of borrowing and real cost of capital to the private sector. Eventually, this combination of large debt, high cost of borrowing and capital weakens the economic uh, growth prospects and undermines confidence in the economy's long-run potential. Slowly, but inevitably, if the fiscal debt goes unaddressed, the currency weakens, as does access to global financial markets. And the cycle wor worsens, leading ultimately to a financial and economic crisis. To me, an interesting example in this respect is Canada in the first half of the 1990s. During this period, Canadian federal debt increased from about 55% of GDP to roughly 70%. At the same time, following a joint agreement between the government and the Bank of Canada, the bank targeted a steady downward path, path of inflation from 3% to 2% at the end of 1995. With no monetary accommodation from the central bank, unsustainable government deficits and debt caused real rates to rise. While Canadian inflation was below that of the United States throughout this period, Canadians paid a substantial risk premium over U.S. rates to borrow. Moreover, the Canadian dollar came under persistent pressure, and overall economic performance suffered with GP GDP growing very sluggishly in the recovery from 1990-91 recession, and unemployment climbed to eventually 12%. These economic conditions contributed to the election of a new government, which made a credible commitment to balance the budget, as Maya has outlined. In the following years, the federal budget deficit fell dramatically. Revenues did increase, and government expenditures were cut sharply. By 1996, Canadian interest rates had fallen below comparable U.S. rates. Inflation remained subdued, real GDP growth picked up, and unemployment fell. So that brings us to the third. And the Canadian experience in the second half of the 90s is suggestive of the benefits of the third. It is the only responsible way to resolve our growing fiscal imbalance. By addressing its source in an environment of price stability, all seem to agree this is the way, in vertigo at least, but of course the devil is always in the details. 
At the outset, it requires an institutional framework committed to having an independent central bank with a requirement to pursue price stability. This discourages the fiscal authority from turning to its central bank, and should it do so, it strengthens that bank's ability to say no. In the United States, the Federal Reserve's policies in the early 80s provide, I think, a good, vivid example of the benefits that arise from the exercise of this independent authority. During this time, high interest rate policies designed to lower the inflation were deeply unpopular both among the elected officials and the broad public. But the Federal Reserve was able to exercise its independence and pursue a long-term goal which systematically reduced inflation and changed the psychology of the nation regarding its expectations about the inflation path. As a result, the United States has had nearly three decades of relatively low inflation. Joint inflation is not an acceptable alternative to strong fiscal management a government faced with rising debt levels must provide credible, long-term plans to establish fiscal balance. The plan must be clear, have the force of law, and its progress measurable so as to reassure the markets, but also the public, that the country has the will and the ability to repay its debts in a stable currency. To be broadly accepted, the plan must be seen as fair, in which there is a sense of shared sacrifice across all segments of the economy. Without being specific, these requirements suggest an approach in which we are willing to disappoint a host of special interests. It means, for example, controlling budget earmarks, not because they're going to make a huge difference, but because we need to establish trust. We need to trim subsidies to numerous economic se sectors. And we must resolve the banking problems and the perception of Wall Street is favored over Main Street. All of which would otherwise foster mistrust and cynicism among the public. And I think that's a big part of the backlash that's going on now. Leaving these issues unaddressed will undermine the essential popular support required for the tough decisions needed to bring our federal budget into balance. Finally, there are no shortcuts. We currently must adjust from a misallocation of resources. That's why this recession is so tough. There's no way to avoid some short-term pain in fixing the fundamentals of our economy. It is inconvenient for the election cycle, certainly, and it is undeniably terrible to have 10% of our labor force out of work. But shortcuts now mean people out of work again in only a few years because we again try and avoid the difficult adjustments that are inevitable. Outlining a credible course for managing our debt now and into the future will, I think, accelerate the restoration of confidence in our economy and, con and contribute importantly to sustainable capital investment and job growth. As I mentioned in the beginning, the fiscal projections for the United States are so stunning that one way or another, reform will occur. Fiscal policy is on an unsustainable course. The U.S. government must make adjustments in its spending and its tax programs. It is that simple. If preemptive corrective action is not taken regarding the fiscal outlook, then the United States risks precipitating its own next crisis. Eventually, government budgets that are severely out of balance are inevitably reformed, either by force of the markets or preferably by choice. Unfortunately, nations often must experience a profound crisis to focus the government's attention on taking the corrective action. Usually it is at this point that the governments establish fiscal discipline, renew their commitment to an independent central bank, and begin to do the cuts that are necessary. Ironically, these generally are precisely the reforms that would have, been prevent, would have prevented the crisis in the first place. The only difference between countries that experience fiscal crisis and those that don't is the foresight to take the corrective action before circumstances and markets harshly impose it upon them. In time, significant and permanent fiscal reforms must occur in the United States. 
And I want to make a couple comments in terms of the, the thought of the word populism and, and, and words like that. It's really about the center, the middle class, who are looking for these reforms. And if you give them the confidence that it will be shared broadly, I, from my experiences in the Midwest, they will follow that lead. But they have to have the assurances. And I much prefer that. I much prefer a credible plan. I much prefer the time it takes to explain that to the center. Then I look forward to the, ir the otherwise ir irresistible impulse of the government to come knocking at this central bank's door. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Any questions? I was going to say, uh, if you're able to join us for a couple of questions, that would be I, I would love to join you, sure. Wonderful. Um, I'm not going to ask a question, but I am just going to comment that I think it's, it's remarkably helpful um, and important to hear from the president of a Federal Reserve Bank sort of what components would make a plan credible. Because I think there is starting to be an understanding of the important benefits of a commitment to a credible budget plan now and how that can buy you a little time. But I worry that the political process will then pull back from what makes something credible and will just say, don't worry, we promise to put a budget deal in place. And so it's, it's helpful to have those benchmarks laid out. Um, let's go ahead and open it up for some questions. Marvin. You make a very persuasive case for the maintenance of the independence of the central bank in dealing with this problem. Um, I was wondering what actions in terms of disclosures and transparencies and accountability of the Fed that you think would be useful in maintaining that independence? Uh, very good question. I, first of all, um, I think that you have to, and, and let me say first of all, the, the central bank, the Federal Reserve, has engaged in a number of efforts to become more transparent. Our minutes are released within two weeks, the transcript is available uh, within five years, which is a big change. But I also think, and, and here's where I think it's particularly important, it is difficult, and, I, and I'm a member of the committee, to, um, because you always want to present a unifying view. But the fact of the matter is the committee is a committee with different points of view. And I think it's very important that the members uh, express their different views so that the people know that there is a discussion going on, that there is a debate that considers the various views and then comes to a decision uh, over time and why those differences are there and why the decision is finally made. I think that would do and is, is something we ought to continue to encourage for the Central Bank of the United States because we have this broad nation and there are, there, there are differences uh, in terms of what's going on in the Midwest or the West or the Northeast and bringing those views forward and expressing that and seeing the difference I think gives people confidence that there is a real debate going on here. The other is uh, we are accountable to Congress. We do need to uh, explain ourselves to Congress, as we do frequently. And we need to do that well uh, and become part of what gives us, gives the broader government, if you will, credibility with the people. And I think uh, that is partly education, getting some of the stereotypical views uh, uh, kind of addressed and behind us as well. Uh, and I asked the question, um, what uh, is your perspective on state and local uh, pensions and the looming problems that they represent in terms of uh, state and local budgets? I think it's going to be one of the most difficult issues we have because it's going to bring, bring up the, the whole issue of moral hazard to a new level. Uh, because if the, government, if the state government cannot afford to make, or the local government cannot afford to make good on those pensions, uh, there's going to have to be changed. They're going to have to be reduced or taxes are going to have to be increased. Uh, but I think there is a real uh, perception that the, gov the federal government will step in and address that 
creating a new moral hazard because that will move, merely move the, the, the deficit up to a higher level. So I think it, it will be um, a difficult debate, but I think what we have to do is say, you have to deal with this at the local level. You have to solve this, or we will only accentuate our own fiscal deficit going forward and create a much more difficult problem for ourselves down the road. Sir, thank you so much for your comments and being here in Maya on an excellent program. Dallas Salisbury with the Employee Benefit Research Institute. Last August, the Treasury Department made a minor announcement, meaning it got very little coverage, that they'd reached an agreement with China and Japan to dramatically increase the amount of U.S. debt that would be issued as tips as opposed to nominal securities. They announced the dollar volume of those increases in December and in January began the first sales. If China and Japan basically become, in essence, more than willing to continue giving money to the United States as long as they can get it in the form of inflation-protected securities and the pressure from foreign lenders to not inflate essentially mitigates what do you think the longer term consequences of that policy shift are? Well, I think it's, it will, um, it's kind of the stalemate for the longer term horizon, but we will, it will come back. The confidence will be lost. We will have the crisis. Uh, and it will be worse because we've allowed the stalemate to go on longer. And I think, I mean, that is a, that is a um, very, I understand the, the desires of having the tips and so forth to protect, but it, it is not an answer to the problem. It is a band-aid on the, on the greater problem, and I fear that the outcome will be just devastating long term. Thank you, sir. Uh, Phil Levy. You make an eloquent case for the importance of uh, central bank independence. I was wondering if you could address uh, some of the challenges to that that have come from an expanded Fed role that we particularly saw in the crisis for, uh, for a variety of reasons, maybe very well founded. The Fed taking a bigger role in supporting the housing market, uh, salvaging in financial institutions, um, but that also seemed to draw a fair bit of political fire and make it a more political institution. Could you discuss that, that trade-off to the Fed role and the central role of price stability that you discussed? That's a, a very fair question. I think it has, there's no question, it has brought us into a political frame beyond what we, even when we were in the 80s as we were pushing for price stability, uh, it has complicated. I mean, when you think about a, a trillion and a quarter of mortgage-backed securities on our balance sheet, it certainly has uh, changed the dynamics for us going forward. Our, our primary goal right now, as has been expressed by others, is this exit strategy. And to do it in a way that is thoughtful, uh, doesn't uh, cause harm, because we're here now. You have to figure out how you get from here to where you need to be. And where you need to be is back as a central bank, primarily focused on short-term Fed funds rate, uh, uh, price stability going forward that then ensures longer-term growth. And we need to remove that, uh, those assets from our balance sheet as quickly, but as carefully and systematically as we can. So we, we take away the, the temptation, which is, I, I can tell you, is immediately there. If you can do this for the housing market, why can't you do this for the ag market? Why can't you do this for the auto market? Why can't you, and the consequences are dire. Uh, so we need to get out of this as quickly as we can, uh, acknowledging that we're there now, uh, but we cannot stay there, or I think we will invite uh, just tremendous uh, adverse impacts on this nation's economy. The back of the room there. Yes, I'm Bert Kurowski from the Voice and Noise Foundation. Uh, the longer the maturity of the debt, pro of the debt, public debt is, the less you need the assistance of inflation to get you out of the problem. Can you comment a little bit on what has been happening?
by actually shortening, shortening that maturity over the last year and what impact that can have? Well, I think its effect is, you know, you know I haven't done the, the sensitivity analysis in terms of what the future cash flow requirements would be, but my, my sense is, again, it's a little bit like our other issue with TIPS. It, it changes the dynamics of the debt, but that's, that's going to be temporary at best. The total debt will be there. And uh, so long as you have that, that's, a, that's an overhang that the public, the public is aware of and the world is aware of. And, and it's not just that it's there, it's that it's growing at a rate that is faster than your nominal income. Uh, the, the consequences are obvious, regardless of the term structure of it. That may affect uh, timing, but I don't think it affects eventual outcomes, at least in my opinion. When you're when you're talking uh, when you're talking uh, uh, net present value differences in your social security and Medicare programs and revenues of 50 trillion, I'm not sure the structure of the debt makes a whole lot of difference to the outcome in the long run. Tom, thank you for an excellent speech summarizing the challenges for a central banker in this era of fiscal irresponsibility. As we heard this morning, we have an intractable problem. The Democratic Party in the U.S. wants to go to European levels of social spending. Republicans want to retain traditional American tax levels. In that, it's a structural budget deficit of about 6% of the GDP. The Fed's program of quantitative easing that began 18 months ago and took the balance sheet to over $2 trillion is scheduled to end in the next four weeks. Short-term programs are running off right now. There'll be no more purchases of long-term securities after March. The question is, go out 12 or 18 months, Right now, we've got a very benign environment. The Fed funds rate is zero. The long-term bond yield is 3.6, 3.7. But 12 or 18 months from now, the Fed funds rate could be 1% or 2%. Who knows, even 3%. If we then have Treasury bonds going to 6 or 7%, do you expect you'll get pressure from the White House, from the Treasury, or even the Congress to restore the quantity of the easing program that we had until a few months ago? And do you think at that time, there'll be people on the Federal Reserve itself with favor for return to the QE program. How do you see the Fed navigating those pressures going out 12 or 18 months? Well, Dave, that's, that's option one on my speech. I didn't care for that option at all. <laughs> Let's keep it that way. But I, I will tell you that I think clearly that if you, if you get out in that environment and your goal is price stability and you're staying with that goal, the pressure will mount. Uh, that's when the independence will be more important than ever to say, yes, we understand, but you, you know, you, there's things you can do, and that's why the Canadian example is so good. If you give us a credible, give us, the American people, a credible program, how we're going to deal with this, and, and you know, the hard fact is, there are no free lunches. You can't give everything, every, everyone everything. Uh, and so we're going to have to make choices. And I have been asked time and time again, well, you know, uh, we need to have a uh, infrastructure. We need, to, we, need to have, we need to make sure we take care of that. And I agree with that. But the, but the point is, you have to begin to make choices in terms of how much and, and, and uh, to what proportion are we going to allocate our resources. If we don't make those choices, eventually the markets will make them for us. And with the scenario you gave, let's say that the Fed went ahead and said, all right, we're going to accommodate this. Especially when the economy begins to grow, what are the interest rates going to be? What's the inflation rate going to be? What's the outcome going to be? And that's what is, it's very difficult when you're in that, in that crisis, the, the immediacy of the stress of the crisis, to look out to that distance. But now we're through it but it will be slow, and that's the insidious part. It's slow and you, you, you know, it takes time and then suddenly you have a, a problem. And remember, they say, well, you know, you can't predict the crisis, and of course I can't. That's why they always come up on you overnight and you have the weekend to work on it. So let's not do that this time. Let's think about it and let's put a credible plan out there. And, I, and, and this is something I think it's important for all, I think we all know this, I, I really do, and that is, it's hard for uh, citizens to say, uh, yes, I understand that we needed to put this liquidity out there. I understand we need to do these particular bailouts. But it does look inherently unfair. And when you have that, you have to change that perspective because it's accurate to some extent, right? 
So now let's, we, let's go through and if we give a credible plan, let's make sure that we explain it uh, to the extent that it's fair. And I, I do, as I said in my remarks, it is inconvenient for election cycles. It really is. That's the hard part ahead. But that's what has to be done or it will be done for us. Go. Do you have time for one more question? Yeah, I have, sure. Yeah, I'm having a good time here, so. Okay. <laughs> good, right here. Right behind you. Anthony Kalanoki. I offered my services to President Obama as his top senior advisor recently, and I don't expect to hear from him, so I'll start publishing weekly on what problems are and best solutions. But several thoughts are. Uh, you mentioned Canada and their new health care system, eight pages. Uh, Mexico has started a national health care system. We have uh, we've spent twice as much of our entire economy as the second highest spending country with this rated number one group. Anyway, make it short. Um, what has been the experience of Canada with the other part of my question, military spending? Several top non-veterans, late 1990s, determined our future 21st century will be military focused. But well, we had a couple of wars to pick that up. Uh, I have some solutions on that, but Canada and so on, how did they, I have a third one, sir. Are there a couple of countries that really have their massive debt in the best way that we can try to copy? Thank you. Well, um, as, I'm not sure I got the first part of your question in terms of, of Canada, but I, I will, you know, the amount of money we spend on health care is a choice we've made uh, as, a, as a nation, either uh, inadvertently or deliberately, but we've made that choice and we've held to it. And, and going forward, we're going to have to sort out whether we want to continue with that choice. And if we bring it back, how will we bring it back in a fair way? As far as the military goes, uh, we, you know, we have a major commitment there. Uh, and uh, so long as we are the lead in the world, then that will be part of our commitment. How much we choose to do, well, that's a choice we make. And then what else has to give behind that is the rest of it. In terms of either revenue, other revenue cuts or other tax increases, that, I said, is a purview of the Congress. But I, my concern is that you, you don't make those choices. And you think that the central bank, by printing money, solves your problem. And of course, all it does is make it worse. So. Um, I think we're going to have to end was, it. He has one question. Okay. He's been raising the hand every time. Okay, I feel if you've obligated. got time, if you've got time, we can do it. I just feel obligated. Uh, Oops. Two, uh, two questions. Uh, no, not you only one. <laughs> you get one. Either. Based on your premise that yes. there are no free lunches, should there be monetary policy? Should it differentiate between productive uses of credit and non-productive uses of credit? We've seen a lot of examples of non-productive, speculative, and credit that increases the concentration of ownership and economic power. But should there be an emphasis or a new emphasis on the productive uses of credit? And I want to go back to the history of the Fed. In 1913, the original power of the Fed, the original way of monetizing uh, growth was in the private sector under Section 13 of the Federal Reserve Act, right. as, as you know. Not 13.3, though. But in, 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 in the Act. And, and then we shifted, it created the Open Markets Committee as we, just about when we're ready to go into war, because the, the political leadership did not want to tax the people for the cost of war, so we shifted to non-productive uses. I'm going to ask if you could just focus, now, focus you gotta your question. Ask, cause I gotta, I, okay, and so the question then is, should we go back to the ideas of monetizing private sector growth that brings about also broad-based capital ownership in the process? Yeah. Uh, well, to, to boil down, the answer to, my, to, to you, in my opinion, is no. Um, it's too blunt an instrument. Part of the speculative activity that we saw in the recent past was too easy a credit for too long. Uh, and so you need to, you need to uh, administer monetary policy. Uh, it, it's a judgment call every time, but you need to focus on the broad, because it is a broad blend instrument. 
And once you get into uh, deciding what's productive and what's non-productive, it's, uh, it, it, then, then you really have to politicize the Federal Reserve, and I don't really want to get into that. Now, in terms of what you, areas that you think should be favored, not, that is a fiscal choice, because those are subsidies and tax policies that you, that you would get. But not, not in terms of saying, you're a good credit, so you get 2%, you're a bad credit, you get 9% from the central bank. Uh, that would be a disaster. So, last question, then I got it. I'll try to make this one real quick. I understand the history of the Federal Reserve it was great service to get it started. It struggled until we went off the gold standard domestically in 33, but then we finally went off the international gold standard internationally in 71. There were no sweeping changes in the outlook of the GAO, CBO, and Federal Reserve. So if there's one point of imagination here, after going off the gold standard, why do we even bother selling treasury bonds? Why not just leave them as a uh, excess reserve in the, in the Federal Reserve? Well, I think, I think it's tempting enough to have the central bank monetize debt. Uh, this give, by, by having this to sell and to focus on price stability in terms of your purchases of them, I think you have a greater chance to minimize the politicization of the central bank. And that's a very important reason not to put them. Plus, I think it would, uh, uh, you still, in, in, in putting those bonds out there, you still are pulling in savings from the U.S. citizen and the citizens of the rest of the world, not just from the central bank. Thank you very so, much, Mike. Thank you. Thank you.